Good evening, and welcome to our first of three Edwards Lectures, sponsored by Louisville Seminary. I am Claudette Snorton. I serve as the Senior Pastor of Lampkins Chapel Christian Methodist Episcopal Church in Louisville. I am also the co-director of the Nehemiah Project, which is a flagship program of Louisville Seminary's Black Church Studies Program which is directed by Reverend Dr. Angela Kauser. The Edwards Lecture Series honors Dr. George Edwards and his wife, Jean. Dr. Edwards served Louisville Seminary for 27 years as a professor of New Testament. Together, the Edwards shared a ministry that was active in the Christian efforts of peace and social justice. I don't know about you, but if we've ever had a time or a need for peace and social justice, I believe it is right now. Now, I will lead us in prayer, and then I will turn our time over to Dr. Kauser, who will introduce our speaker for the evening. Bow your heads with me. Gracious one, we come this evening asking that this lecture be a time of reflection, a time of knowledge, and a time of power. We ask that you give us hearts that are excited and hearts that are open as Dr. Brogdon expounds on his knowledge of the Pentecostal tradition. And we also ask that you bless each of us during this time of growth. And now we ask that you bring peace and justice throughout our land and country and beyond. And we pray a special prayer for peace and justice for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine. To this we pray in, in the name above all names. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Snorton. It is my distinct pleasure this evening to introduce a dear friend, colleague, interlocutor, uh, buddy, uh, profound researcher, scholar, pastor, father, parent, um, uh, it, and it, it, it is in the person of the Reverend Dr. Lewis Brogdon. Let me tell you more about him. Dr. Brogdon serves as the Associate Professor of Preaching and Black Church Studies and is the Director of the Institute for Black Church Studies at the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky. Dr. Brogdon has served in numerous positions in both undergraduate and graduate institutions, including Simmons College of Kentucky, Claflin University, Bluefield University, and Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary as both professor and administrator. He was the first Black Studies, Black Church Studies Director at Louisville Seminary, and we uh, have been building uh, Dr. Brogdon off of your august legacy, and thank you for that groundbreaking work. Dr. Brogdon is also an accomplished writer. He is the author of several books, such as A Companion to Philemon, the Spirituality of Black Preaching, The New Pentecostal Message, Dying to Lead the Disturbing Trend of Clergy Suicide, Hope on the Brink, and No Longer a Slave, But a Brother. As a regular contributor to Christian Ethics Today, Virginia Capital Connections Quarterly, Black Politics Today, in the Louisville Courier Journal, Dr. Brogdon authors articles and opinion pieces for both academic and non-academic audiences. He is also a public intellectual and sought out preacher, lecturer, consultant, political advisor, and panelist. Dr. Brogdon, again, welcome back home to Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. The floor is yours. Please proceed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kauser. Uh, and, and the first thing I want to do is I do want to honor uh, God for the opportunity uh, 
to deliver tonight's uh, Edwards lecture. I am an alum uh, of LPTS. I did my uh, MDiv uh, back in 2002, and I came in at the exact same time with uh, Angela Kowser. We are really, really close friends. We started mid-year J-term uh, yes. together, yes. Uh, and God has just blessed our paths to kind of uh, to, to intersect in, in interesting and wonderful ways. And so uh, when she reached out, uh, do you know anyone who could you know, lecture on African-American Pentecostalism? Of course, if it's an opportunity to support the work uh, that Dr. Kowser is doing, uh, I'm all in. In addition to, it's a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to kind of, in, in a sense, to, to, to come home uh, and to be able to uh, be a part of uh, the LPTS family. Uh, LPTS has meant so much to me. I would not be where I am today if it was not for some of the major, major uh, people who have influenced uh, and gave formation to my path. And so, uh, especially uh, the New Testament professors that I had the opportunity to study under uh, when I was a student, uh, Marty Swords and Sue Garrett. And so I just wanna give them a shout out and to uh, all LPTS friends who, uh, I, won't, I can't see your names on the screen, but I do want to send you greetings. I'm going to share my screen and we are going to jump in. I am here remotely. I'm spending some time in my second office here uh, in, in Virginia. Uh, and so I'm actually not in Louisville. I also want to give a shout out to my seminary, the Baptist Seminary of Kentucky and to Simmons Nation uh, and the outstanding work uh, that we are doing just on uh, the other side of the city. Tonight's lecture is titled The Unfinished Business of Azusa. The Unfinished Business of Azusa Toward an Afro-Pentecostal Theology of Social Justice. Gonna try to do about four things in uh, tonight's lecture. The first thing I'm going to do is, is to say a little word about the centrality of Azusa uh, and the importance of Luke Acts. So when you, if you wanna understand Pentecostalism and particularly African-American Pentecostalism, then you, you have to know a little something about the importance of the Azusa Street Revival that happened in 1906, as well as the importance, uh, the writings of Luke Acts, how important those texts are for Pentecostals, especially uh, the book of Acts. So that the first move is just to say a word about that and that sort of forms the backdrop to a discussion and an exploration of what I would call the sort of contours of Afro-Pentecostal thought. So I'll just introduce you to you know, some, of, some important developments uh, in the history of Black Pentecostalism, the important scholars doing work. So I'll, I have some slides to show you, uh, you know, some of the preeminent uh, theologians and of course, you know, I will argue for one who I believe is one of the most important black Pentecostal theologians uh, in the world. and doesn't have anything to do with the fact that I studied under her uh, in my PhD program, uh, Dr. Estrada Alexander. So I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about the contours of Afro-Pentecostal thought and history, which then will lead into something that happened at the end of the uh, Zeusa Street revival that, that set the stage for, for malaise and decline in American Pentecostalism. And so I'll talk a little bit about some problems and some promises before shifting as I conclude to talk about my, uh, my work and my research as I am working to uh, construct an Afro-Pentecostal theology of social justice. So let's begin. When People study the history of Pentecostalism, and it, it depends on the books you're reading. There is a narrative about the Pentecostal movement, and the narrative goes a little something like this. Uh, there is a, a white man uh, who, uh, his name is Charles Parham, who did a in-depth study of the Book of Acts, uh, and he came to the conclusion, now, this is, of course, this realization he makes is that doesn't occur in a vacuum because really for almost a century, uh, people in the Wesleyan tradition, the Wesleyan holiness movement have been talking about these post-salvific 
uh, subsequent experiences. Uh, they would use the language of uh, entire sanctification or sanctification, but that language started to shift to talking about uh, this baptism of the spirit. So Parham came up with the, with the formula uh, that his, his read on Acts, if you take a careful look at particularly Acts 2, 10, and 19, how a person knows they have been filled or baptized in the Holy Spirit is they, they speak in tongues. So Parham came up with the, what's called the evidential doctrine. Uh, and on January the 1st, 1901, Agnes Osmond uh, speaks in tongues, and she speaks in tongues for literally hours upon hours and, and hours. So Parham starts teaching this doctrine to people, uh, the doctrine of spirit baptism. And there was an African-American leader in Houston who heard, uh, who heard this teaching. His name was William Seymour. And because of uh, Jim Crow laws, he was not able to be in the class, but he sat outside in the hallway. Uh, and, 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 and was listening and learned about this. And then Seymour takes Parham's doctrine to, to Azusa, uh, which is out in uh, Los Angeles, California. So from Azusa Street, Pentecostalism becomes a major, major movement. People from all over the country and literally all over the world were coming to this small mission, uh, were experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit and they were taking the message uh, of the gospel that, you know, it, it, was a, it was kind of apocalyptic. They believed that, you know, Jesus was getting ready to come back. And so they had to evangelize the world. And so many understood that tongues was going to help them to be able to preach the gospel in languages they did not know. So from Azusa, uh, a, a global movement got started. Now, now I'm not saying that the global Pentecostal movement started in America. But I am saying that the Azusa Street Revival was one of the major, major, major centers of what would become global Pentecostalism. And the spirit baptism doctrine was of paramount importance. So many were coming so that they could experience uh, this, this feeling, this baptism of the Holy Spirit. In, in fact, many denominations that were in the holiness camp moved over and became uh, Pentecostal uh, be, because they received this experience. And some in the holiness tradition rejected the doctrine of spirit baptism and they remained in, in, in the holiness camp. So Azusa is very, very important. Uh, many of these Pentecostal denominations, they all trace their roots back to the Azusa Street Revival. Now, not only is Azusa important for, for Pentecostals, but Luke Acts is, is very, very important. Here in this text that's on your screen, uh, text entitled Spirit and Power, Foundations of Pentecostal Experience, William and Robert Menzies, in, in, in dialogue with, with white evangelicals, are, are articulating some of the elements and contours of Pentecostal theology. And, and one of those essays spends a significant amount of time talking about how important Luke is uh, in Pentecostal theology, drawing on some of the work by Roger Stronstad, which talked, you know, who, who wrote a book called The uh, Charismatic Theology of St. Luke. So you have these Pentecostal theologians arguing that Luke is more than a historian. Uh, Luke is, is a theologian a great theological resource, uh, and that Luke's pneumatology is different from Paul's. And so there's a, there's a need to give Luke uh, theological credence. So any understanding of early Pentecostalism and Pentecostalism as a whole, there is no escaping the centrality of Azusa and Luke Acts. But this is a bit of a problematic and narrow picture because it really ignores uh, the role of the black church, its leaders, spirituality, and its theology. It also minimizes how widespread and extensive uh, the bondage of racism was among white Pentecostals. So when they tell their history, it's this valorized, uh, cleaned up narrative 
You get this doctrine. This doctrine ends up in Azusa. Uh, and God takes this message all over the world and it takes the world by storm. And it really tamps down and it downplays the important contributions of African Americans. So what a lot of black scholars have been doing for decades, uh, I'm a member of the Society of Pentecostal Studies and, 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 and Pentecostal Studies, Renewal Studies, it, you know, it's, it's decades old. So there's, there have been people who have been doing this work for, for quite some time. And, and it's even having a significant impact on our white sisters and brothers because the narrative about American Pentecostalism is starting to change. What you need to understand is Pentecostalism is the product of African spirituality and the black church. Because what doesn't get told a lot of times in these earlier accounts of the origins of Pentecostalism is that Azusa is, this is a black church. <laughs> this is happening in a black church, in black space. Uh, the leader, the pastor of that church is a black man, is a black person. Uh, and many of the early pioneers, the, the, they're black people. And, and so there is a serious need to, to reframe how we think of Pentecostalism as not really the, the product of, of white Christianity, but really this is a, a product of, of black Christianity. And, and, and the irony of it, uh, and, and both the import that you have a movement that comes out of the black community becoming a major global movement. So one Pentecostal historian named Vincent Sinan, who has written extensively on American Pentecostalism. I took classes with him when I was uh, uh, completing my PhD. I mean, he, he is one of the historians of, of the Pentecostal movement. So at the turn of the century, you know, he did a lot of writing. And in one of his books written for a more popular audience, you know, he just gave you just some of the statistics and the data on just how powerful and how, how big a movement Pentecostalism has become. Uh, in fact, besides Islam, Pentecostalism is one of the largest sort of religious movements in the world. Uh, you really should not ignore Pentecostalism and you, you cannot ignore Pentecostalism. And, and just the level of ignorance in the mainstream academy about this movement is really, it's really mind blowing. Uh, you know, because the, some of the largest churches, some of the fastest growing denominations, they're, they're all in the Pentecostal uh, movement. I mean, you, you ought to see uh, Paul Young Cho's church in, in, in South Korea. I, I mean, it is massive. You ought to see some of these churches uh, in, in parts of Africa. I mean, it is, it, it is a major, major movement. And it's a movement that you can trace some of these roots back to the continent of Africa, the spirituality of African people that has become global. And then a movement that was happening uh, as slave religion emerged into you know, the institutional black church. And at the turn of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the 20th century, you, you end up with um, this, this global movement. And so it's, it's important to me as a scholar of the black church and a scholar of the black Pentecostal movement to make sure that people understand when you think of Pentecostalism, you need to be thinking about the black church. Now to narrow our focus a little to African-American Pentecostalism, some of the largest black churches in the United States are in the Pentecostal tradition. And I'm using that term Pentecostal very broadly. There's really three terms. Pentecostal, is often a term we use to describe people who are in these classical denominations that trace their roots back to the Azusa Street Revival. So kind of like the Church of God in Christ, you can see uh, the emblem uh, there on your screen. And in fact, the first church I pastored was when I was in uh, Church of God in Christ in the state of Virginia, third jurisdiction. Uh, and so I was a, a, a Elder Brogdon back in, back in the old days. So before I was Dr. Brogdon, I, I was Elder Brogdon. I was in, in the Church of God in Christ. It's the second largest black denomination. Uh, the National Baptist USA is the largest, over 7 million members. Church of God in Christ is over 6 uh, million members. So Pentecostal really refers to those people in these denominations. The term charismatic 
uh, that describes people who experience aspects of Pentecostal spirituality, but they do not leave their churches. So they're in Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Presbyterian churches. Yes, my Presbyterian sisters and brothers, there are some folks in the Presbyterian church who speak in tongues, uh, who will lay hands on you, uh, but, they, but, but they're not going to go join an assembly of God or a church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. They're going to stay uh, right there. Now, some, a lot of that has died down. It exploded in the 60s, and the charismatic movement uh, had a major, major impact uh, in a lot of Catholic circles as well uh, in the United States and abroad. But the term charismatic are for folks who they stay in their tradition, but they don't accept the, um, the, the, the whole focus on tongues, the doctrine of, of spirit baptism. They're like, no, there's just an emphasis on all the gifts of the spirit. Uh, one of my good friends who is a vice president at, uh, at your seminary, Louisville Presbyterian, uh, Reverend Dr. Kylan Gray, he is what we would call a Baptocostal because he keeps a foot in the Baptist and the, uh, the, the Pentecostal world. Uh, so he, he's in that charismatic camp. And then you have a lot of these, what we call neo-charismatic. They're not connected to uh, a Pentecostal denomination, uh, a Catholic or a mainline, they're not connected to Catholic or mainline churches, they're these non-denominational churches. And that's where you have a tremendous amount of synergy uh, and growth. So some of the largest denominations, uh, churches, they're all in uh, the, the Pentecostal family. And even for those who may reject aspects of Pentecostal theology, uh, will be appropriating aspects of Black Pentecostal spirituality. And so whether it's uh, folks, you know, got their hands up, uh, beating the drums, um, if, you, if you understand your history, these are the very things that the Black Baptist and Methodist was trying to tamp that stuff down. But the folks in the Holiness Pentecostal tradition, they held on to these Africanisms uh, and, they, and they have survived. And so people are kind of reconnecting to some of those things. I want to just take a few moments and, and lift up some of the important people who are doing outstanding work uh, in the area of African American Pentecostalisms. And of course, I will begin with uh, Dr. Estrella Alexander, who has done her book, Black Fire, is the definitive uh, text on uh, Black Pentecostalism. I mean, she, she put a lot of tremendous work into that. She's done some work with Amos Young on Afro Pentecostalism. And she has started the William Seymour Foundation and Seymour Press and, and is publishing and writing uh, Up a Storm. Uh, so she is one of the most important Black theological voices in the Pentecostal tradition. That's aside from the fact that she uh, mentored this uh, outstanding student that you see presenting tonight. Just a little humor for you. Cheryl Sanders is one of my favorite uh, womanist ethicists. She is at Howard University, not in the Pentecostal tradition, but she's in the holiness tr tradition. Uh, and so, you know, we're kind of like cousins. Uh, so Sanders' work, Saints in Exile, fantastic uh, uh, study. I use her empowerment ethics in both undergraduate and graduate courses. Uh, uh, you know, Sanders is outstanding, uh, an outstanding womanist. Ithiel Clemens wrote the definitive history of the Church of God in Christ, and I'm going to comment about some things that, that he, he mentioned in that text. Anthea Butler's uh, work on women in the Church of God in Christ, uh, I mean, it, this, it's, a, it's a stellar study that, that shows the ways Black women were negotiating and navigating power within a patriarchal structure. So they cannot be ordained as, as pastors, they cannot be ordained as elders, uh, as bishops, but, but in that women's department, within that denomination, I mean, they wielded a tremendous amount of influence and power. So she did a wonderful job really documenting and, and, and chronicling an important aspect uh, of that history. And she tells the truth uh, about the history and it's important. There's also some emergent uh, voices People who are doing, I mean, they, they, when I say emergent, that means in the past few years, they have really risen to prominence. And Yolanda Pierce, who, Yolanda Pierce, who is at, pretty sure she's at Howard. Uh, and Antipas Harris, who is the president of Jake's Divinity School. 
So they're doing a, just a lot of outstanding work. And you can see uh, here Harris uh, editing an anthology talking about the Holy Spirit uh, and social justice is what is Christianity, the white man's religion. So they're starting to weigh into some of these conversations about social justice issues. And then I have done uh, extensive writing on Pentecostalism. Now, two of these volumes are, of course, they're, they're edited volumes where I've, I've written essays, one on African-American Pentecostalism, and then another essay in the Global Renewal Christianity on uh, prosperity, prosperity preaching uh, within the Black church context. And then I wrote a full text, a great primer that adds a lot of nuance to our understanding of the, uh, the prosperity movement. And I argue that you, you can't understand this movement unless you understand it as a Pentecostal movement. And so these sort of reductionistic explanations to try to say, oh, it's just metaphysics, mind science that, that Hagen took from somebody else. It's really not to understand the, the, the vast world of global Pentecostalism, the tremendous amount of variance there and prosperity looks different depending on where you are uh, in the movement. There's also some centers, institutions that are committed to uh, studying the, uh, the, the practice of Pentecostal spirituality. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm sure you've heard of, of T.D. Jakes. Uh, you may not know that, you know, there, there's been a divinity school started. So I did want to lift up that. But of course, ITC uh, with Mason Theological Seminary, ITC, that's, that, that's, that's black space uh, down there in Atlanta, Georgia. So what Jake's Divinity School is, is, is a sort of new iteration of, of, of a Pentecostal school that, that's, in, that's in black space. It's, it started in a, in a black church. Howard University has historically had a lot of uh, Pentecostal uh, scholars on the faculty supporting that scholarship. Virginia State uh, ha has had a very, and that's Baptist, but very, very recently, uh, it's really starting to give concentrated focus and energy behind uh, the study of uh, Black Pentecostalism. The seminary I work at, I teach courses on, uh, on the Pentecostal heritage uh, and we have relationships with Pentecostal clergy uh, across the country. Fuller Seminary is another one of these places, Louisville Seminary as well. Just a couple of things from the, the history of Pentecostalism that, that I want to lift up. First of all, what these scholars have tried to do, these black scholars, is to shift the narrative about American Pentecostals, to, you know, to really explore William Seymour's agency in a more forthright manner, rather than, uh, you know, this black person who was sitting outside the classroom, heard this doctrine, you know, took master's doctrine out to Azusa, and told him, hey, you know, here's the truth, because I heard it from a white person, instead of understanding, yeah, we, he may have heard that doctrine from Parham, but I think the way he would understand it, practice it, was qualitatively different. And guess what? When black scholars start to do this kind of work, guess what they found? Oh yeah, Seymour did have a qualitatively different take on some of these things. Clemens' uh, history, you know, his historical work on the movement, he really focused on the fact that what Mason was trying to do uh, and the Church of God in Christ, this is the, the largest black Pentecostal denomination. The founder was trying to hold on to aspects of slave religion. And so there's a famous picture of a Bishop Mason holding up a whole bunch of roots. And Mason was known to have a powerful healing ministry. And his healing ministry uh, was very African. Okay, he, he would use some of these African roots to, to, to heal people. And so Mason saw things, uh, you know, because he, he it's, it's the generation, the last generation of, of enslaved Africans he saw things in their spirituality that he wanted to hold on to. Uh, and so he, he did that and, and, and Mason had a close relationship with Seymour. And so in a sense, what they're doing is they're bringing that, that affinity, that desire to hold on to things from slave religion uh, and to continue to practice those things uh, and to integrate those things into their understanding of, of the Christian tradition. And let me tell you something, 
sisters and brothers in the in the black Baptist and Methodist world, they weren't happy about that. They they were trying to you know fit in with the sort of white establishment and to, and to say that we're we've moved away from those those crude you know Africanisms and those practices and you know we don't need to do all of that you know that dancing and that shouting and you know, all that moaning and the groaning and the wailing and the travailing and the visions and the trances. No, no, you know, we, we, we can have the same kind of worship services our white sisters and brothers are having in the Baptist and Methodist church. Uh, so when I was fortunate to, to, to go and to meet with Dr. James Cone a few years ago, uh, and, you know, one of the things he was telling me was that, you know, one of the biggest mistakes the black church made is it basically, it had a borrowed theology. It just, once we moved into institutional forms of church, we just appropriated some of the, the, the theology of our white sisters and brothers instead of, instead of carrying over what we had in slave religion in a more forthright manner. So it created tensions and, and debates. So when the Azusa Street revival explodes, not only is it you're gonna get persecution from uh, folks in the white community, but there's also virulent persecution even within the black community uh, as they are pushing back on what is happening uh, amongst you know this this upstart movement, I want you to see this black church, and 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 this used to be an AME church, and and thanks be so so you see some of the uh, cooperation between uh, uh, traditions going on all the way back to this time. So they they let them use this building, and and they're at the top of the screen beside the mission is William Seymour. There's the picture of, of Mason with, with, those, with those roots. You have uh, Seymour's wife was a powerful preacher and Lucy Farrell, a very, very powerful preacher. In fact, uh, and I'm gonna show you Bishop Ida B. Robinson who she founded uh, and served as the, the first presiding Bishop of the Mount Sinai Church. And there is a uh, Bishop Ida B. Robinson. Okay, so, <laughs> Before you get womanist theology, here, here's a black Pentecostal woman who starts a denomination. Uh, she is a presiding bishop. So that shows you Pentecostalism was kind of ahead of some of these other traditions when it came to some of these issues. But that is not to say that, that the movement did not have significant problems with sexism uh, and, and patriarchy. It, it did and it continues to have uh, those problems. But I do want to lift up something. This is what Black historians and theologians have, have uncovered, is that Seymour had a different take on the doctrine of spirit baptism. Uh, and, and, and it's one of these areas we'll, we'll need to continue to, to do some work to, to build up on. Seymour believed that there should be no color line or any other division in the church of Jesus Christ, because God is no respect of persons. For him, the real sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just speaking in tongues, but how you treat your sisters and brothers. And so the reason this is important is because, and I have it in bold on your screen, because what the history is going to tell you, 1906 to 1921, 1922, 1923, our white Pentecostal sisters and brothers, they are going to they're going to reject Pentecost. So, so here's what the history tells you. White Pentecostals will reject Pentecost because on the day of Pentecost, you have people from uh, all over the diaspora uh, gathered in Jerusalem and the spirit comes in like a mighty rushing wind. Uh, so Pentecost is a, is a celebration, yes, of the power of the spirit, but the, you know, the spirit really being poured out on all flesh. And when Peter gets up and preached, he echoes the prophecy of Joel, that this is that, you know, that was prophesied uh, by Joel, uh, that in the latter days, God will pour out God's spirit on all flesh. Well, white Pentecostals have a problem with black and brown flesh. So what ends up happening is you have this, this interracial period where the movement is very, very progressive. I talk a little bit about this in uh, an essay I, I wrote in the Handbook of Pentecostal Spirituality. During the early years, we're talking about 1906 to 1914, blacks and whites from across America worshiped together in a black church under a black pastor that gave birth to the Pentecostal movement. At Azusa, 
Blacks and whites worship together without any special prohibitions, governing interactions, no divisions at the altar, were all sought to experience the Holy Spirit. One eyewitness, Frank Bartleman, reported that the color line was washed away in the blood of Jesus. The whites who attended were startled by this practice, and many had life changing experiences. So, in this sense, the Azusa Street Revival offered Pentecostalism, as well as its Protestant counterparts, a new social model for American churches to follow. There was potential at Azusa for a movement that would incite great social upheaval and transformation. But what ended up happening is racism reared its ugly head. Parham taught, uh, Seymour, the, uh, the, the spirit doctrine, bap, uh, the, the spirit baptism doctrine. But then when Seymour invites Parham to come and preach and Parham sees blacks and whites worshiping together, he loses it. And, and the way he describes what was going on uh, in very racist and pejorative terms. He, he literally tries to take the church over, uh, you know, so that, you know, you don't have the mixing of the races. Seymour makes a decision to, uh, he had a very close relationship with, with a white lady and was interested in marrying her. Bishop Mason told him that it would hurt the movement. Uh, and so Mason decided, I mean, Seymour decided not to marry her uh, and, and ended up marrying someone else. And, and the lady took the mailing list and left and went to Oregon. And that had a debilitating effect uh, on their ability to continue to raise the funds to support the mission. You had whites and what is now the Assemblies of God getting their ordination credentials from Bishop C.H. Mason. They were under a black presiding bishop, but then decided in a meeting in Hot Springs, Arkansas, to pull away from this black denomination and start their own denomination. And that's only just a couple of examples that this, this invitation that the Holy Spirit was giving Pentecostals to, I think, exercise a level of leadership that could have transformed, uh, could have transformed this country. We would probably be a different country today had they not quenched the Holy Spirit, but they did. They rejected Pentecost. So some of the work that I'm doing on, uh, on a book entitled uh, Same Name, Different God, Question Mark, uh, White Christianity and the Question of Idolatry, when you study basically America 1900 to 1970, it's hard to do, it's hard to look at white churches without understanding the, the, the influence of racism, just, just how significant, how beholden white churches are uh, to racism and white supremacy. And so there are two, two major movements coming out of black space during this time. You have the Pentecostal movement and the civil rights movement. And both were by and large rejected by, by white churches. Uh, and so the, the book is, is, is revisiting old arguments that enslaved Africans were asking about, I don't know if we're serving the same God. Sure, our names are the same, but I don't know if we really have uh, the same God. And just think of the irony of, of, of claiming to encounter the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, where you can work miracles open blind eyes, raise up people who were, you know, lame and crippled. I mean, grandiose kinds of promises, but then the Holy Spirit can't do anything when it comes to the color line. You have whites who were under black leadership needing to pull out, uh, start their own network, and then later say, okay, yeah, you blacks can come, but you can't be in our churches. We will start uh, a, a sort of Negro division within our denomination. So the Assemblies of God did it. Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, they did it. They, they don't want black people in their churches. Okay, they want them in their denomination, but just not in our churches. We need to, you know, we need to keep our distance. So they practice, not only were they supporting segregation socially, they were practicing intra-segregation in their denominations. And so what ends up happening is it just, it sets the stage for a movement that can do nothing when it comes to the color line. 
You may not know this, but the Dakes uh, Study Bible, which is, which is a very, very popular study Bible in, in, uh, among Pentecostals, my, my former pastor, he was Elder Malvers Simpson when before he became Bishop Malvers Simpson. And he, he swore by the Dake Study Bible. That's the only Bible you're supposed to be able to use. But what you may not know is some of the earlier uh, editions of the Dake Study Bible, and it's been removed, but some of the earlier editions of this Bible would, uh, you can actually find 30 reasons for the segregation of the races. All right, so... So again, they can experience the power of the Holy Spirit, but then when it comes to the color line, it's almost as if the spirit doesn't work in that area. The white gentleman on your screen is Ken Hagen Jr. Uh, was preaching before his church, telling his church, you know, teaching them about who they can marry, who they can't marry, and was instructing those white Christians, we can be friends with black people, but we cannot marry them. His good friend and another pastor out in Los Angeles, out in Crenshaw, Fred Price, somebody sent him that tape, uh, and the Pentecostal world exploded, okay, because Fred Price went public with all of this and demanded that Hagen uh, repent, and he only wanted to say he was sorry for those words, but he did not want to acknowledge how sinful those were, and so Price commenced for months to teach on race, religion, and racism. I mean, it, it exploded nationally. Okay, so when I, I, I teach this stuff, so whether I'm teaching it here or doing adjunct teaching, I had a, a student that asked me a very, very powerful question about why the Holy Spirit can't do anything about this. And, and it, it just got me thinking. He says, I am struggling with the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. Shouldn't the spirit be revealing to us how we should understand scripture and act accordingly? I asked because I had another professor from South Africa. He grew up in white South African Pentecostal church during apartheid. While his church regularly experienced the operation of spiritual gifts, including prophecy, he never recalls a word from the spirit speaking against racism, oppression, or the apartheid government. My question is, how can the spirit not speak out against such injustice that even worldly human institutions recognize as evil? My fellow uh, professor friends, you know, man, your students can ask a question. It's not always an easy answer, but the fact that he was asking that question uh, was an invitation for me to continue to do some deep wrestling. And so we had a, a wonderful conversation about that, but I never forgot uh, the question that he asked which then leads me to talk a little bit about the state of Black Pentecostalism before I, I shift gears. Let me check my time. All right, I'm doing well. African-American Pentecostalism today, some of the big developments is the emergence of what I call Episcopal networks. So what's really growing, moving, and popping in the world, and I'm talking about American Pentecostalism, Classical de denominations, they are, in, they are experiencing malaise and decline. Where there is growth is going to be these neo-charismatic, non-denominational churches. That's, this is where you're seeing all the synergy, all the growth. And I talk about this in my book, The Spirituality of Black Preaching, that a lot of these leaders are realizing that just because you have autonomy doesn't always mean that that's a good thing. And so there's a real need to have some accountability, some structure, some of the <laughs> very things that denominations were providing. So they're not gonna create a denomination, but they do create these, these networks, which are just small versions of denominations. Uh, and the, the episcopacy is just, for some reason, the, the Pentecostal tradition, there is just such a deep value uh, of the Episcopal tradition. So, man, in, in the Black Pentecostal world, Man, everybody's a bishop, an apostle. Okay, if you, if you just if you just a pastor, man, that's like a little junior league title. I mean, man, these folks uh, they just love these titles, and 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 some of these people are legitimate bishops because they have networks and they provide uh, covering and 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 a lot of things for churches that are in their network. <laughs> a lot of these, but some of these people, you know, they'll be an apostle in a storefront church for like four members. 
uh, or, or a bishop in some little small church with like 10 or 12 people. Uh, and nobody, they're not supervising other churches. And so there's just a lot happening there. And I have a really good friend, Bishop Jonathan Alvarado, who is a, uh, is a part of the African-American College of Bishops. And they're doing a lot of work to, to try to bring some structure and some accountability and some understanding to, to, to what the Episcopacy really means. Uh, so that's an interesting development in the Black Pentecostal world. Uh, the prosperity movement has fallen on hard times. It started in 2008 when the economy collapsed and it's just been a lot of develop, developments that have continued. And so it's just a movement that people who were deeply invested and committed to this movement, are they're really, really struggling. Uh, I have to tell the truth that there is widespread sexism and homophobia uh, in the movement. Uh, there's been some, some recent incidents of, of black clergy, sometimes at, at major like conferences, major convocation events, just saying just homophobic, uh, hateful things that are just very, very uh, inappropriate. And there has been appropriate backlash. Uh, and so there is a movement within the, the, the Black Pentecostal tradition uh, to carve out those spaces uh, that, that, that are affirming so that people don't have to continue to suffer uh, in these, uh, in these net networks where they are you know, being told they are possessed with demons and, and, and all this kind of Thing. So a lot of work to be done there. The sexism issue, there's some complexity there because you do have a lot of, you know, women pastors, uh, who, women who exercise significant leadership. Uh, clergy couples is a big thing in the neo-charismatic world, but it often still doesn't escape the sort of patriarchal framework that there may be a bunch of clergy couples, but they may be, there, but they're probably going to be under a presiding bishop who's still going to be a male. And most of the members of the African American College of Bishops, they're mostly all, all male. And so uh, the, the movement still has a significant amount of work. I mean, there's most of the denominations in the Black Pentecostal Church, they do not ordain women. Uh, so the, the large ones, they, they, they do not. And, and it's 2022. Uh, and, and they're still having those conversations. There's this huge gap between this progressive work black scholars are doing, but that doesn't always mean that is translating down to the congregational level. And so given things that have been developing in this country since the election of Barack Obama, followed by the election of Donald Trump, if you are in a church tradition that doesn't know how to talk about social and political issues, that's not comfortable talking about issues of race, then the, those black churches are struggling. And many of those churches are Pentecostal. I, I, I did a recent uh, Black History Month celebration in the black Pentecostal church. And, and, and some of the leaders there, not the pastor, the pastor is, is good, but some of the leaders there don't have the language to kind of talk about, about these things. Because it, you know, there's a lot of talking about the Holy Spirit and, and what happens in, in the context of worship. But how does that apply to what's going on outside? the four walls. So it's a painful truth that the roots of white evangelicalism run deep in, in Black Pentecostal churches. Those roots run pretty deep. So Dr. Alexander, in an unpublished essay entitled Pentecostals in, and Social Justice, she just went on and named one of the criticisms that often the movement gets characterized as a tongues movement, it's all emotion, it lacks a clearly articulated, cohesive theology. That they really neglect social justice issues. Now, given our history, if you understand the, the history in the holiness movement, there was, a, there was a strong concern for social justice issues. And then at the congregational level, congregations engage in social action. It's just they don't always make the connection to these broader systems. And I talk about this in my book, The New Pentecostal Message. Uh, so two of the essays in there that I think you may wanna take a look at, one essay is entitled, Is Prosperity Teaching Good News to the Poor? And then I end with, Is Prosperity Teaching the New Pentecostal Message? And I, I argue that there is some promise that if the prosperity, if prosperity theology evolves, 
then maybe that's going to be a good thing. But if it doesn't, I don't think it should be the new Pentecostal message. And one of the problems I, I highlighted was the theology is still underdeveloped and that prosperity teachers don't know how to take up issues of systemic poverty, much less systemic racism. Uh, and so they end up glossing over those uh, issues under language of like generational curses and, and, and divine favor. Uh, I think it's great that the movement is trying to give attention to poor people who want a better life, but it's like, what are the systems <laughs> that disenfranchise so many people, particularly the black poor? Okay, it's not just Satan. Uh, it's not just demons and, and generational curses. Let's, let's talk about what happens when you enslave people for 240 plus years, and then you follow that with these systems of neo-slavery from Jim Crow to convict leasing. <laughs> to, you get redlining, and then you follow that up with mass incarceration. Those are systems, and, and you've got you've got to deal with that at the systemic level, and you, you can't just always name it and claim it and, and use that kind of spiritual language to gloss over those important issues. I said at the outset that the Pentecostalism is vibrant in the majority world. And one of the very interesting developments is the emergence of what some scholars call progressive Pentecostalism that looks different. It looks different than the folks doing liberation theology in South America or the social justice uh, tr tradition that's happening in America. In, in the majority world, in places, Africa, parts of Asia, Central, South America, these Pentecostals are engaged in, uh, in what the scholars described as community-based social ministries. So they are engaging society in a way that's distinctly Pentecostal, that fits who they are. And I think that's some of the work that we need to do. And so the unfinished business of Azusa, it is theological. We need to develop a theology that does two things. It delivers from social evil, whether it's racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, so we need to do some, some, some pneumatological work in that area, as well as pneumatology that manifests social transformation. So really what I'm doing is I'm circling back around to the sort of original vision, the original genius of the movement that holds to the significance of Azusa and Luke Acts, but it reframes it. And which leads me to some of the work that I'm doing. Uh, and if you want a fuller elaboration of this work, you'll just have to invite me back again uh, and I can get down into the weeds. But I just wanna touch on uh, some of this work that I'm doing uh, and I'm gonna be done. This Black Pentecostal theology that I am thinking through has a new biblical paradigm. You know, and Classical Pentecostalism, it is Acts chapter two. But I, I am currently, and I have done a lot of work on Luke and I'm continuing to do that work uh, on Luke, focusing on how Luke's soteriology intersects with his, his pneumatology. And I'm gonna, I do wanna, I do wanna read. Luke Acts is paradigmatic paradigmatic text for Pentecostalism. But in the tradition of black hermeneutics where you counter interpret texts. So in white Pentecostalism, they're focusing on Acts chapter two. This Afro-Pentecostal hermeneutics says, no, we need to, to look at three places. First, Luke 4, 18. Second, Luke 19 verses one through 10, the story of Zacchaeus. And then the third place is Acts chapter 10. And in Luke four, Jesus uses the language that the spirit of the Lord is up on me. The spirit has anointed me, making a connection between the anointing of the spirit 
and the proclamation of good news to the poor. And in the Lucan tradition, proclaiming good news to the poor, it's not just saying, oh, God loves you, but it's saying, you know, the kingdom has come to do something about your situation, which then puts some teeth in other stories in Luke, like the story of the Good Samaritan. Or what happens when you don't do this work? The story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, so the announcement of good news to the poor is pneumatological. The story of Zacchaeus' transformation is one of the most powerful stories in, the, in, in Luke's gospel and really in, in all the gospel writings. But what is it that inspired Zacchaeus to say what he said? Because the text does not say Jesus told him to say these things. Uh, and so to me, that's, that's room for some pneumatology. In the presence of Jesus, Zacchaeus wanted to do what was right. And what was right was to go back to sort of Luke's vision of what a salvation looked like. It's a willingness to forsake everything to follow Jesus. Now about 88% of Americans are opposed to reparations. And most of those people opposed to reparations claim to be Christian. Do you not read, you know, what Jesus said in Luke, that if you are not willing to forsake everything that you have, you cannot be my disciple. We're having conversations about racial privilege, how to, do, you know, people needing to divest themselves of the privilege unjustly given them. And, and, and white progressives, they think we should be happy just because they want to have the conversation. They never move to do anything. And even when progressive white institutions decide to give, to, to do something uh, in regards to reparations, they just give it to, to, to their own institutions. They reallocate their own resources uh, to joke. There must be this willingness to give up. What do you mean you're opposed to reparations? Why are you trying to hold on to what you have? What does that have to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? But that's what happens when you take the teeth out of Luke's gospel uh, and you preach this gummy version uh, that goes on in a lot of these uh, white pulpits. An encounter with the spirit, you're gonna give up your privileges. You're gonna repair. If I've cheated people, I'm gonna make that right. There ought to be a movement in white churches to fix what happened with genocide and the enslavement of African-Americans. But what have we gotten? Nothing but just neglect, kicking the can down the street. I love the story of Peter's experience in Acts 10, juxtaposing that versus Acts 2, because what it shows is, is sometimes folks need a second baptism. And my white sisters and brothers, they need to go to Acts chapter 10 uh, and to stop thinking of black and brown flesh as unclean. So that's some of the work that, that I am taking up because to me, Luke's understanding, his soteriology and pneumatology, has been ignored by white Pentecostals. But the work yet to be developed is some of the constructive work I'm trying to do by circling back around to Seymour's vision, a vision rooted in African spirituality and the black church. And I think Seymour's vision has this Lucan flavor to it because the spirit transforms the person and their social sphere in radical ways. So the unanswered question of black Pentecostalism is the social focus. That's some of the work that I'm continuing to do of how to apply the work of the spirit to the work of social advocacy and social justice in radical ways. That's some of the work that I will be taking up and doing in the days and weeks, uh, months and years to come. And I'm just gonna flip over and show you a quick slide. I'm also doing work uh, on, on the demonic uh, that brings together within Pentecostal studies, a focus on all things of the spirit, all things pneumatological uh, and black studies that focuses on um, our history and our experiences. Uh, and the whole category of the demonic is Eurocentric. You, you have the liberal saying demonic evil is all a metaphor for, for human evil and, and, and human systems. And then you have the folks who 
who believe the demonic is real. It's always what is happening where black and brown people are. But I've never found a resource, and I've been doing research for a few years, of white folks saying there's anything demonic about enslaving, about lynching, about redlining, and about holding on uh, to privilege. And the folks in the black and womanist tradition, the category of pneumatology is grossly underdeveloped. And so there is an opportunity for the black Pentecostal tradition to engage uh, in some of that constructive work. And I'll be doing that as well. Thank you. I finished eight on the dot. I'm an old pro. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lewis Brogdon, LPTS's own. <laughs> Thank you for LPTS that. LPTS proud. Yes, right. LPTS strong. Uh, we thank you tonight for um, your conversation and your sharing about uh, Black Pentecostalism and what has happened, what is happening, and where your research is leading you. And so that's one of the goals of our Nehemiah project and our Black Church Studies is to compel people to want to do research and to provide them with the necessary information and tools that they may be. So you may end up out of this conversation, have some folk who will be digging into this right along with you. Um, as our Cassie, our host, will open up the chat room. We invite our audience tonight that if you have any questions for Dr. Brogdon, that you would please place them in the chat or somebody's done the Q&A, either one, and we will get the questions to Dr. Brogdon so that he may give us our answers or give us where we can direct. She's given a sign that says, now the chat is open. Okay, uh, we have a question here in the Q&A uh, from our own Dr. Terrence Bridges. Is there controversy around Bishop Mason's picture holding the roots? <laughs> you interpret it as the use of roots. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's very interesting, you know, when you're doing, when you're doing work about in the area of black church history and, and just the history of black folk. It's so many things we don't know about our own history. And so some of the things we discover about our history, they're aha moments and they kind of confirm, oh, you know, always, you know, always kind of suspected that. And then there are some things that kind of catch us off guard. Um, and so seeing Mason holding up these African roots, I, I think folks in, in the world of Koji, they feel a certain kind of way about that. I, I would probably say most don't want to, Want, they don't want that picture to be something that's 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 mainstream, um, because certain African practices they they are still considered very very taboo and problematic uh, in Black churches when you understand just how extensive an influence white Christianity has played on how black people think about themselves and things from our culture. And so, I, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of ambiguity, but the folks Don and Dash, Dashikis and the whole Afrocentric movement that exploded in black mainline churches in the nineties, man, they was late to the game. Black Pentecostals, folks in the holiness was doing that a long, long time ago. But I will admit that completely fell off. It, it dropped off being intentional about that. Great question. All right, uh, Reverend Harriet McElvaney asks, what is the difference between the holiness movement and the Pentecostals? Wonderful, wonderful, great question. The, the holiness movement pre, precedes the Pentecostal movement. So what ended up happening is uh, 19th century, so you're talking about the 1800s, you got the folks who are in the Wesleyan camp. Uh, in this insist this insistence that you need this unique experience started to go a little bit beyond what traditional Methodists were comfortable with. Now they were okay with this with the language of this, uh, you know, th this baptism of love because it it wasn't like this distinct post salvific experience. It was just a part of their understanding of piety and spirituality. 
but the, a group started to believe, no, you need a distinct experience um, so that you can live a sanctified life. Uh, and so the holiness movement started. So this is where you get the language when some black folks stand up in church and they say, I'm saved and I'm sanctified. Okay, that language of being saved, sanct saved is just the sort of, as Protestants, we're part of the sort of Reformation tradition that places an emphasis on, you know, being, you know, experiencing salvation. The sanctification piece, that's from the holiness folk. But then over time, they started to argue that you need another experience called this baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sanctification purifies you from sin so that you can live a holy life. So, you know, it was all about living holy. But you need to be empowered for ministry, empowered for your life, empowered to do things God has called you to do. And so that language of a third blessing came into the tradition. Of, and, and it coalesced around the language of this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the people in the holiness tradition said, nah, we don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All you need is to be saved and sanctified. You don't need the, the, this doctrine of spirit baptism. And so Jones, C.P. Jones, disagreed with the spirit baptism doctrine. C.H. Mason embraced it, went to Azusa, experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Church of God in Christ moved from being a holiness denomination to a Pentecostal denomination. And so it just depends on what you believe about the doctrine of spirit baptism. Uh, and it's all about when that doctrine of spirit baptism is the evidence of knowing you got that is you speak in tongues. All right. Another question from Pastor T. Devon Franklin III. How has the full gospel Baptist fellowship impacted the traditional lines between Baptist and Pentecostal traditions? Ah, oh, well, I got to give a shout out because that's, that's, that's one of my students, uh, Devan. Good to see you and great, great question. Uh, the Full Gospel Baptist Fellowship is, that's a very, very interesting development. So they embrace under the language of the full gospel, uh, all the gifts of the spirit. And that's, and you, and you can only understand it if you understand that against the backdrop of this of this teaching called cessationism, that is this rampant in a lot of white and mainline churches. That that stuff that was going on in the early church, they came up with this argument: God kind of need to do those things uh, to you know solidify the gospel, you know these miracles and stuff because you didn't have the canon. But once you kind of got the word, you didn't need all you know gifts and miracles and all that stuff that you, you, you read in these New Testament stories. So this doctrine of cessationism pretty much won the day so that people who are operating in the gifts of the spirit, man, they're looked at like, they're, like something's wrong with them. So the Full Gospel Baptist Fellowship, being a part of the charismatic renewal, they embraced the gifts and just called it the Full Gospel, but they weren't leaving the Baptist church. They were just bringing some of that. Uh, and, and they, and, and you, y'all, I'm, I'm in the Baptist church now. So I'm like, Kyle, and I'm Baptist Uh, You can be duly aligned. You could be a part of all different kind of conventions. And so they, they started their own little mini convention and were often uh, members of either NBCA or, or, the, or the National Baptist USA. But I think over time, that group has really been getting smaller and smaller. But I think it's had a pretty significant impact because even though you have folks maybe in NBCA and National Baptist uh, USA, who don't, you know, they don't want to hear no folks speaking in tongues in their church. Well, they're not going to teach it, but they might see folks doing it, and they're not going to get up and be preaching against it. They're just kind of, it is what it is. And so some of that is the influence of both these Pentecostal churches, as well as even Baptists practicing some of those things. Uh, you know, you might have, you be in a, a Baptist church, and you got a Sunday evening service, and you, you bring it in one of these uh, full gospel persons and he's coming in there and a lot of times it's just shouting and being charismatic and enthusiastic and uh you know maybe they might speak in tongues real real briefly or something as they're praising god but it's it's the piety is very very similar uh but great question all righty dr kabibi mcshee max shelton okay 
Um, I'm just going by her initials here. She asks, do you think the Pentecostal black churches will ever open up to and accept differences among people such as issues of the LGBTQ community? This is a reality in life where all families have transgender or same-sex relationships of some type. And I'd like to know what you think for the future on this thinking. Well, I, I want to give a shout out to the person who asked the question. Uh, uh, my friend, uh, Kabibi, we were both uh, in the same department at Claflin University, one of our great HBCUs in South Carolina. She is an outstanding uh, historian and, and a wonderful friend from UMass Boston who is tuning in. So I must be doing something if I got a big time scholar like that. I don't believe so, Khabib. I don't think the denominations are gonna are gonna budge on that issue, uh, and 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 I am all for uh, inclusivity. And so, what I'm behind is then trying to support these spaces that that are affirming. Uh, I mean, if we can't get these classical denominations to even budge on women preaching and pastoring, I mean, in some like you can go in some old school Pentecostal churches, and it's literally like stepping back in time. Uh, and it's just a lot going on in, in, in those spaces that, you know, they're, they're not always the most pro pro progressive spaces. Uh, and so do I believe you're going to see a movement among a lot of these major denominations, you know, in the Pentecostal family uh, to be more inclusive? No, but I'll tell you what, when, when uh, Skip Gates' doc, PBS documentary is kind of pulling the covers off uh, of you know, the black church on this issue. And, and, and one of the persons, uh, Bishop Flunder, she's, she's Pentecostal. We, I mean, this is somebody we lost uh, because, uh, you know, we were uh, oppressive in, in our theology, in our praxis. And so if, if, if we want to continue to grow and be viable, then we're gonna need to see some movement. But the, one, but the genius of the Pentecostal movement is you don't need those denominations you start your own networks and that's exactly what's happening. And so to me, that's, those are gonna be the places where you see the movement being uh, uh, more inclusive and more open. Hey, thank you. Dr. Kowser has a question. Uh-oh. Are black Pentecostals able in the 21st century, able to keep youth and young adults in their churches? Especially given the positioning of uh, Black Pentecostals, Kojic, other major denominations that they're not moving on these questions around sexualities and for which many young people for whom that is a central issue. Your response, please. Well, I think just like a lot of these uh, Black denominations, whether they, are, uh, whether they are Baptist or Pentecostal that are continuing uh, to be non-progressive on those issues, it is affecting them. Uh, so this is why you're seeing some of the malaise and the decline. And if you, if you just look at the data, even though just from a demographic standpoint, mm -hmm. black people support their church and participate in worship. I mean, there's nobody even close to, you know, our high levels of participation, but there has been decline. And it started right around probably 19, between 89 and 91. So now you're starting to see more and more African Americans who are dismayed with the, uh, with, with the black church. And, and some of that is around some of these very, very uh, important issues. There's a uh, black Pentecostal church in Virginia I spent a lot of time uh, preaching at, and it's a, it's a story of two churches. You have a group of very, very old people, and then <clears throat> you have a group of these young people who love God, they love Jesus, they, 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 they love the word, they love the church, but they are in a different place on a lot of these issues. And so they're trying, you see them, you see them trying to be engaged uh, and trying and, and, and living into their Pentecostal faith in ways that's authentic to them. If they're, if they're getting support, I think it helps, but a lot of times they're, 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 they're hitting up against some, some walls. So in the non-denominational area, I think that those, again, spaces where youth are starting to gravitate there, but some of these more traditional networks, and some of these young people are kind of old school, conservative and traditional, and, and, and they kind of like that, but there's just a mass of people 
who just aren't going to accept those things anymore. Uh, some of these regressive beliefs about how women are supposed to dress, conduct themselves, their body. They're just saying, no, 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 no. We're, we're, we're not going to do that. Uh, and, they're, and they're giving some appropriate pushback either within those congregations or by leaving. But we're, we're in a hot time where this is kind of playing itself out and, and we'll kind of see uh, where the chips fall. But, the, but I, 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 I talk with denominational executives and presiding bishops, and there's a lot of anxiety about our future because the black church is by and large a baby boomer church. And when that baby boom generation is done, the black church is going to be changed. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend off. Eric Shoemake has a question. Uh, does Pentecostal doctrine supersede the holiness tradition and belief? Read that again. Does Pentecostal doctrine supersede the holiness tradition and belief? Well, I will say the Pentecostal movement is, 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 is much larger. Uh, it, its influence is, is very, very extensive. The holiness movement, you're talking about a very, very small movement within, uh, within the black church. Uh, one holiness Black holiness denomination is called the Church of God, Anderson, Indiana. Cheryl Sanders is a part of that, that holiness denomination, but it, it's, it's very, 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 very small. And so what ends up happening is the, the holiness doctrine, I think is probably strongest in two black Pentecostal denominations, the Church of God in Christ and PAW, Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. They teach holiness all the time. When I was a, 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 a young pastor in the Church of God in Christ, I mean, we probably talked about holiness more than we talked about God, Jesus, the gospel. I mean, everything was holiness, and it was, and the message was basically, you know, holiness of hell. And it, so, very, very conservative. Uh, but the Pentecostal movement is much, much bigger, and the, in, and the focus on the work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, empowering us for ministry and for and empower life, that kind of, that, that kind of won the day. Hey, uh, a comment from Dr. Bridges in relation to the um, question about the openness for the LGBTQ. And he says that there are open and affirming sects of Pentecostals. Uh, he names a Bishop O.C. Allen Great. as one. So there is, within the Pentecostal movement, according to Dr. Bridges, some churches that are open and affirming. I know I've also spent time in the spiritual church and they too are open and affirming. Yeah, that's good. That's, yeah, it's, 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 it's fantastic and, and so good to hear. And the, yes. the work of Bishop Yvette Flunder, I'm, I'm not as familiar with the work that she is doing, but, but I'm fairly certain because she's, a part of the Episcopacy, that there's probably a network of churches that's affiliated uh, with the church that she is leading. And so that, there's probably a network there. And, an, and another piece of the sort of inclusive pie is the story of Car uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson. Yes. To be this very, very prominent uh, yes. Pentecostal pastor in the uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma area. Grew up in Kojic, uh, went to uh, ORU, Great, great singer, very, very gifted. Oral Roberts treated Carlton like he was a son. Carlton Pearson would have these uh, these Azusa Street meetings that were the you know it was they were legendary. They were on TBN. In fact, Carlton Pearson is the one that gave TD Jakes the national stage and national platform. Right. Jakes went and preached at that conference. Jakes preached behind closed doors, and his name just boof. You know he he, he exploded. But Carl Person was struggling with the uh, with the you know with the Pentecostal traditions teaching on hell, and he started to question that because he was he's, he was sitting home one night seeing some uh, poor kids in Africa who were you know starving to death and you know it was kind of a feed the hungry kind of thing, and they they were Muslim kids, and he and he was sitting there and he had this crisis moment where he was like here these people are starving to death. And they're not Christians that, you know, they're, 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 
they're black Muslims. And, and when they die after living this horrible life, then they're gonna go to hell. Uh, Gandhi is, is, is gonna go to hell because Gandhi's not a, um, so he started raising questions and well, you know, the, the black Pentecostal church did not want to, they did not want to listen. He was, they came down on him very, very hard. He was kicked out of the, uh, the, the college of bishops or, or Roberts tried to, you know, pressure him to, to recant the statements. And so Carlton Pearson ended up leaving the black Pentecostal church, ended up, uh, in the uh, Universalist Unitarian Church, yeah. and I'm not sure if he's still there or or if or has he moved back into a sort of neo-charismatic, non-denominational, where he still tries to uh, engage the Black Pentecostal and the Black Church uh, on the issue of what he calls the gospel of inclusivity. Uh, and the reason I brought that up is that he just wanted to have conversations about an issue. Anybody who cares about humans and has any pastoral sensibilities, I mean, we can't we can't have conversations about a doctrine that this kind of problematic. Uh, people felt so threatened, and they needed to kind of shut, tamp that down, and shut that down. Uh, and so, to me, I think that set the stage for some of the malaise and decline uh, that we are seeing. But then what ends up happening with the, with the Obama Trump years and not being able to kind of weigh in on what is happening in this country racially, uh, not being, not feeling that the spirit is calling us to call that stuff out. Uh, it, it hurt, it hurt black Pentecostal churches. And so while folks were protesting, I was engaged with two presiding bishops who were talking about social justice issues, but a lot of these pastors that I know, they didn't even know what to say, how to even, get into the conversation about those issues. And so that could have been me had I not went to LPTS and you know, uh, connected with uh, my Baptist sisters and brothers who have a little bit more of a history and tradition of talking about some of those issues. So I was busy in 2020 as a, as a Pentecostal talking about these issues. As a Baptocostal, uh, just in case Dr. <laughs> Tober hears that. <laughs> okay, hey y'all back that up and clean that up on, when you edit it. <laughs> All right. uh, Dr. Kabibi uh, makes a statement here that the youth will lead the way one day. Uh, and I hope so. And that's that, a lot of my passion in the classroom. Yes, yeah, she says the youth will lead the way one day. And uh, what else did she say? Perhaps not in our lifetime, but the new world is changing and it will be under their leadership. Uh, Dr. Kalser has another question for you. What is the fear in Pentecostalism with questions? Well, I think some of that goes back to just how deep the roots are. Uh, white evangelicals, so because the Pentecostal movement was so persecuted in the early stages. I mean, um, man, you folks in, in, in the Baptist, Methodist, in the Reform, man, y'all was cracking down on, on these Pentecostals and, and, and their spirituality. And so the movement felt it needed to eventually legitimize itself. And so once it established a relationship with the National Association of Evangelicals, the movement almost thought, okay, now we're, now we're legitimate. The, the, the white evangelicals, the, you know, they've, they've accepted us. Uh, and, and to me, I think that that, that really hurt the movement. Uh, and so when I was a, a pastor uh, in, in Kojic, here's this, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm in black space. I'm, a, I'm pastoring black folks, even though my, my, my church was, was, was about half black and half white, but I mean, it's still a black church. All the books I'm reading are written by white, white evangelical, white folks. That, that's all we were reading. They were, they were providing all our theological training, all the books uh, that, that we were reading, they were framing how we thought about all these issues, and I didn't know how Eurocentric it was until, you know, I'm in seminary, and I turn in a 30-page chats paper to Dr. Stephen Ray, which I thought that 30-page theology paper was like my magnum opus, you know, I, I, I thought I wrote a really good theology paper, and he says, uh, Lewis, can we go off campus, and I was like, sure, you want to take a brother out for some coffee or for dinner? And uh, Dr. Ray took me off campus and read me the riot act, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep it 
I'll keep it PG what he said to me. But he told, basically said, stop reading books by people who don't care about you and don't care about your people. Uh, but that's all I knew. The first time I read books by Black folks was when I was in seminary. Uh, and so I think, Angela, some of that is these deep influences of, of white evangelicals in the Pentecostal world who have told them how to think about these yes. issues. Yes. And have passed the, the, you know, here's what it means to be Pentecostal. Instead of getting it from Seymour, yes. you know, they're, they're getting it from, you know, the, these, these white evangelicals. Uh, and, and so they're they're just feeling the pressure to, and then when you your ordination credentials and you there's a certain line you have to toe uh, to to be ordained. You you just almost get you get conditioned to think a certain way. So then when you start raising questions that fall outside, you know those those boxes, and they don't have the resources to to grapple with that. Uh, so I so I spend time not just with my students teaching them how to grapple with these issues. But I also do this work with existing clergy because a lot of times they did not get that either in the training they were exposed to or they may not have had any, any training that have given them those skills and tools to understand that God is big enough for your questions. What happens to LGBTQIA persons in Pentecostalism? Do they have to hide? That, that gets to the authoritarianism. They have to continue to, do they have to hide or leave? You know, what, go ahead. I don't, I don't, it just, it depends on the church. Uh, the person like in our particular district, I mean, there were people who were, who were, who were openly gay. They weren't hiding who they were. They had to live with the homophobia. And, 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 and I've, I have a, a book I've written that I'm using in a, in a workshop that I'm gonna be teaching in a few weeks. Uh, it's called Losing and Deepening Your Faith. And, and in the book, I talk about some of the things I used to believe that I don't believe anymore. Uh, and one of those things was the, uh, the, the sexism and the homophobia. You know, and, 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 I, and I understand Paul, when he talked about, when he calls himself the chiefest of sinners, not worthy to be an apostle because of what he did to the church. And I can understand that when I think about some of the sermons I've preached in my past saying women can't do things because that's, you know, that was the line we were taught. Or when pastors are up saying mean, hateful, sometimes violent, homophobic things, and, and we get worked up in a frenzy and are, yes, yes, preach it, you know, participating in, uh, in, in, in violence. And, and I'm thankful for the grace God gives us to move beyond those kinds of beliefs. Uh, and so there are sisters and brothers who are in those churches and, and they're, they're managing it the way they want. They, they love those churches. They love those spaces. And uh, they're not the most comfortable spaces for them to be in, but there's just a lot of complexity there. But now that we are socially in a different place around a lot of those issues, I think there's also a lot of encouragement for folks to find spaces where you can, where, where you can authentically and truly be your, your full and complete self. And in some communities, there may not be spaces for that. And so again, they're, they're, they're managing it as best they, as, as they can. But that's a that's that's a great question, and it, it and it reminds me of some of what women are doing in those traditions. Mm -hmm. my, my mother is a very very powerful preacher, very powerful preacher. Uh, she just, she's never had a chance to pastor churches, uh, and it is only because she is a woman, and and she won't leave. She, but that, that's her, that, but you know, so it's her choice to kind of stay and to be engaged and understand the limitations, and it's a lot of complexity. Uh, in those conversations. Dr. Oh, Margo, we, we are, go ahead, Dr. McIntyre. I was gonna turn it over to you. Yes, we have about two minutes uh, before we come up on the 8.30 time here in the East. Uh, we want to thank you very much I, I, for a nourishing, very thought-provoking, well-researched and really um, beautifully presented 
uh, lecture conversation this evening with our attendees. I'll be back to talk to you about, uh, we're rethinking the Black Church Studies Certificate Program in its entirety. And I, and I think we need to offer a course on, on Afro-Pentecostalism as part of that and would love to, you and I have a time to talk. We'll talk more about that. Um, so what we heard tonight was uh, really a recentering of the right centering for Afro Afro-Pentecostal thought and practice in Pentecostal charismatic, neo-charismatic uh, congregations. We heard about the doctrine of spiritual baptism, the links between African spirituality and the black church that presents some tension uh, for some people, the way that racism, uh, as, it off, as it will always do, uh, destroys uh, the work of, that the spirit is called to, to do. Uh, in the world, uh, we talked about prosperity preaching. There's a lot there that we need. We need. I, I wanted to explore on why that movement has collapsed, um, and and then your research and your areas of probing and uh, of growth for Afro Pentecostalism in the 21st century. So we want to thank all of our guests also for coming, and I think Dr. McIntosh, we wanted to put something in the chat about. Dr. Camille Brown, who is our next lecturer, um, will be talking about, about Black Roman Catholicism. And then we'll be talking in our third and final lecture about uh, Black Baptist life. So yes. Dr. Uh, Brown, I think Cassie was going to put that out there in the chat okay. for okay. next week. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brogdon, we're going to ask you, uh, since you're on a roll, to close us in a word of prayer uh, and thanksgiving for the life of the mind and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. You have a lot of courage asking a Pentecostal to, to close out the prayer. So I'm gonna hold y'all to nine with this prayer. No, let us pray. Loving God, our hearts and our minds are on fire. On fire with your love of justice. Thank you God for spaces even spaces over Zoom, to love you with our hearts and our minds. We pray that what was presented and shared and discussed, that we will find ways to use it, to take up the real work of justice, yes. change, healing, and reconciliation in this broken world. May your spirit empower, may your spirit also liberate and free us from bondages, keeping us from faithfully doing your work. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus the Christ, amen.